Um, well, thank you all for joining our Change in Behaviour series this morning. We have a full lineup for you today. The entire Insights team are going to be taking a piece each, so it should be a really good session. Um, just a small housekeeping point to put any questions into the comments box on the side and we'll address those at the end um, and just keep yourself on mute. Um, we will be recording the session so if you have to drop off um, no worries you can just go to our YouTube page um, and you'll be able to watch it. We'll also send it around afterwards as well. Um, so I'll intro introduce the team. We have Alex Wright, our Head of Insights, um, as one of our speakers today. We also have Nathan Lawson, who are our two regulars. And then today we also have Emily and Emma joining us um, as part of the lineup. So I'll hand over to the team to get started. Um, this week we're looking at uh, how footfall has impacted various different sectors um, now that um, non-essential shops have opened up in the UK. So over to you guys. So uh, I appreciate we're starting a little bit late, but we'll still try and have it wrapped up for you uh, by 11. Um, so to start with, uh, along the bottom there, you can see, um, as Kelly said, we've got, we've got the whole team, Northern Hemisphere at least, presenting. So myself, Nathan, Emily and Emma are all going to uh, take a section or two each as we go through. So roughly following this timeline. So when the UK went into lockdown on March 23rd, uh, everything changed, or, or did it? Um, at least it changed temporarily. But then as we look through each of these milestones that we've been through since, so Boris Johnson's announcement to return to work if you can't, return, if you can't work from home uh, in early May, then through the, the reopening of some of the DIY stores and home stores that weren't open throughout the crisis up to that point anyway. Uh, then a look at uh, car dealerships from June the 1st and then most recently onto non-essential retail, which uh, just opened a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Emma will wrap up um, with talking about groceries, which have been open throughout and can maybe give us uh, a hint to what we might expect um, from other sectors as they get more competitive. It's too early for us to talk about the reopening of uh, pubs and the hospitality sector and other parts of the service industry. Um, so we'll be keeping that one in store for a subsequent session. Uh, so the heading on this one, reopening the country, kickstarting the economy, was what um, Rishi Sunak was talking about uh, almost a month ago, uh, I think now. Um, so he and Boris have been talking this week about um, different ways they can kickstart other sectors. So the construction uh, manufacturing industry has been the focus for them. Um, so they are kind of trying to pulling the, the levers in the corridors of power there, if I'm not too clumsily mixing metaphors. Um, there to try and uh, expedite green lights on projects across the construction industry uh, to get that part of the economy moving. But as we all know from previous sections, it's um, consumer spending uh, that makes up the vast majority of GDP. So that is what we really need to start happening. Um, and it all must happen uh, still against the backdrop of coronavirus. We have not got rid of the disease, um, but at least things are, are heading steadily uh, if somewhat slowly in the right direction for us. So we have this update here um, up to uh, a couple of weeks ago now, but the trend has continued since. So the green line shows the rolling average of the number of new daily cases declining. Uh, that decline is slowing somewhat, but as long as the pink line, which we'll zoom in on here, stays below zero, uh, then we are not seeing an increase in cases. So this, this stands currently in quite stark contrast to the US where they are seeing uh, an increase um, in the pink line, um, shooting up past zero, heading towards about 20% increase in week-on-week -week, um, growth in cases. So it is, it is imperative that um, if incidents crop up, like uh, we need to put specific cities into lockdown, that those measures are, are swift and then they can be equal, lifted equally swiftly without impacting the, the broader picture. Um, so that's the context and, and this is our uh, gentleman of focus this week, it's Andy Haldane, uh, economist at the Bank of England, who was saying on Tuesday that the recovery in the UK is coming sooner and faster than expected. So we can be optimistic uh, for a V-shaped bounce back. Obviously this is a, a choice cross-section of the quote, 
Um, it does come with caveats. You, you can't talk to an economist without there being some caveats and recognition of the, the imperfections in the school of thinking around econ economics. Um, but broadly speaking, I think this is a positive story for all concerned. So as we go through various sections of this report today, uh, we're going to call out how some of that V-shaped bounce back appears to be happening in various retail sectors. So before handing over to, to the rest of the team uh, to talk through those bits, just uh, an update on, on our own um, economic tracking, so consumer confidence, three question survey, very simple. The first question relates to the green line. Um, how do you feel about the UK economy? Are you optimistic, pessimistic or neutral? And after a series of, of fairly stark, frightening declines, uh, the last couple of dips we've done, uh, both of them uh, in June, either side of the middle of June, have seen confidence creep back up again. Um, however, it's, it's from a particularly low base, a historically low base. So this minus 30 is uh, the kind of numbers we would be seeing as we were emerging from the last financial crisis, but still in recession. So these are, these are still not necessarily good pictures, but interesting nonetheless that people are expressing some optimism. And it comes hand in hand with, with relative optimism about household financial situation as well. So while confidence remains low in the economy, it is increasing and people are uh, relatively confident about their own financial situation. So if consumer spending is going to get us out of uh, the economic crisis we're currently wallowing in, um, people seem willing to participate. And just to rattle through some of these key points, uh, overall financial caution pervades, but home improvement is still a popular option uh, where to direct disposable income. So the saving and debt repayment. Um, over the last three or four waves now, I think if we concentrate on them in this slide, have all seen, have, have seen a cumulative decline. So any of these kind of financially motivated, financially sensible measures, some might say, um, have seen a decline in the number of people saying that this would be their number one priority, which leaves open the opportunity for increases in some of these other sectors. So we've said the home improvement sector, uh, sector remains uh, a popular outlet, even if it's declined somewhat in the last wave, still remains the second most popular option behind saving um, for people in the UK. Uh, interesting cars, which Emily's going to talk about a little bit later, uh, for the year peaked in June. Um, so there was more demand upon the dealerships reopening than there was at the beginning of the year, uh, which is interesting. It, it's flattened a little bit since, but it'll be, we'll be we're keeping a keen eye on this in the run up to uh, Q3. Obviously, the new registration plates will be due for launch in September, historically uh, the biggest month of the year for buying new cars. Um, holidays um, have, have had a lot of coverage recently and over the last two waves have, have seen an increase in interest, an increase in, in intent from consumers about wanting to get some time away uh, to escape the, the cabin fever we've all experienced in the past 101 days now since the UK entered lockdown. Um, we, can we put coronavirus in room 101 yet? Probably not, not yet. Uh, and the last element on this is that if consumer spending is going to get out, guess it gets out of this, it might have to be little and often. Um, people are not going to be splurging this discretionary spend on wild shopping sprees, uh, but nonetheless spend is picking up. Um, so other sources have reported um, double digit increases in spending, uh, albeit compa in comparisons to, to May uh, and May to April. So. Coming from a very low base, things are trickling back, but they're certainly trickling back in the right direction uh, with more detail to come from the team. Um, so before I hand you over, we've, we've talked about commuting uh, and public transport, maybe particularly as, as the canary in the coal mine, if people are willing to pack themselves into carriages with other people, then that indicates some kind of receding of, of caution. So we have this data. Uh, up to about two weeks ago, which, which gives us um, four weeks since the advice to return to work if you can't return from home using public transport, if you must. And what we can see is uh, taking national commuter stations um, as our proxy here, we saw an enormous spike um, in returning passenger volumes in that first week following the announcement. 
However, things dipped off uh, very, very quickly and quite dramatically after that, suggesting that the people who needed to return did, uh, but even then potentially it was short term, just using trains as an example. Since then, uh, there has been a modicum of, of bounce back with, with about one in five uh, in terms of passenger volume returning to what we would have seen pre-COVID. However, the national picture, uh, as we all know, the averages can disguise a lot of the valuable nuance beneath that, contradicts the London picture, or at least it's not supported by the London picture. So while there has been a slow and, and very slight increase from, from the week of the announcement on the 11th of May, it's yet to manifest itself properly in London, uh, which could be a result of the, the relative ratio of white collar workers who are able to continue working from home in the capital. Um, and those obviously within the commuter zone do not have to use these commuter stations as much. So uh, there are uh, practical nuances to this as well, but it's too soon to say that, that mass, uh, there has been a mass adoption of, of returning to public transport. So I'm going to hand you over now to Nathan to talk you through uh, a bit more about the, the home store sector. Cheers, Alex. Um, so what we've done over the last few weeks is just really monitor the home stores. They start to open up again in the UK. Uh, if you change the slide. Um, so what we've been looking at is um, how visitation, so the unique number of visitors going to these stores, compares over time and particularly looking back to what we've defined as a sort of normal level. So here what we've used is the week commencing 24th of February as a baseline. So say for example, if you look at the 2nd of March where the figure is 85%, that means that unique visitors in that week represented 85% of the volume that we'd seen in the prior week. So what you can really see is that there was a trend of decline even going into, um, into lockdown. Consumers were starting to self-distance, so what we've seen in other verticals. Similarly, also um, a spike around the 9th of March. So people stocking up, and again, we saw that in grocery, we saw that in pharma, you know, that sort of rush just before lockdown for people to really get the essentials they need. If you click this one. Um, on the week commencing the 18th of May, so this is the first week that really saw major openings. Uh, in the category, there were a couple that did stay open because some of them had the protected status, but mainly uh, these retailers focused on home delivery or sometimes click and collect. But really in this week, we saw a lot of reopenings and that sort of buoyed footfall in the short term. So we see that visitation was about 60% of the normal level, but actually that rather than indicating a sort of starting point, the sort of low point for consumer confidence that they could then build off, actually it seems like it was a bit more of a short term burst. So people having this pent up demand. As Alex showed, you know, spending on home was one of the key or, uh, parts of intent. Um, and people, you know, if you live near a Dunelm, if you live near a range, suddenly it reopens, you've got this need, you go in, you buy that product, but you don't need to return. So you're not seeing as many incidental visits. You're not seeing people go back for more sustained needs. People trying to minimize moving around. So then you saw visitation really drop to new lows for three consecutive weeks. And that's despite some more retailers coming back online. But what's really interesting and one of the really key themes of this is that when we see the week of the 15th of June, things pick up again. Um, and this continues into the week 22nd of June. This is where non-essential retail started to reopen. So this is really important going back to sort of what Alex has talked about, consumer confidence. There are so many parts to this. You know, it's not just the economy. It's also in terms of health and the risk of going out and about. And of course, by opening up more areas of retail, you're seeing people become a bit more confident. You're giving them you know, new areas to try and return to familiarity and it helps boost confidence that can then lead and feed into other areas. And on top of that, you've got incidental visits. So more reasons for more consumers to go to areas of retail that then benefits and you know, the high tide rises all ships, as they say. So I'll just skip to the next one. Um, and just click again. Uh, and so there's some key trends in terms of home football that we've observed over the period. As I said, in the ninth week commencing 9th of March, you saw a sort of stock up um, mentality. And this could be quite interesting. Hopefully we don't get a second wave um, and maybe we won't in the UK, we might see in some other markets, but it could provide an indicator of what we could expect again. So consumers taking in the sentiment that's been given out by the news, by the government, and actually leading people to stock up in advance of the lockdown coming, uh, coming into place again um, as I said 
when we break it down by the specific retailers, it's a bit clear to, clearer to see the, uh, the theme that I was talking about, which is here we saw Dunelm on the range, home base and furniture village, four of the key retailers in the space reopen. And this is what really led to that surge in footfall. And as you can see for the 25th, the 1st and the 8th of June, successive weeks of decline. So as I said before, not reflecting a build, building consumer confidence, but actually short term demands necessitating people to return. But actually in the last couple of weeks, some really positive numbers. So you're seeing consecutive weeks of increase for all but two of the retailers, um, leading to week over week increases in footfall, which is the first time since pre-COVID. So really the reopening of all other areas of retail is giving you know, more incidental visits that people just happen to go in because they're browsing, but also makes people feel more comfortable. And this is the big challenge that you're going to face in travel. Uh, pubs will also face this, I expect, after people have their first taste this weekend of the experience, is making very familiar aspects of our lives alien again. And so rebuilding confidence is not just about financials, it's also about you know, behavioural and the societal sort of impacts. And so what we've seen here is two consecutive weeks of increase, and we expect that actually as more areas open up, whether that's pubs, restaurants, cinemas, gyms, people become more confident. They also, their footfall is leading them to go into different areas of the resale high street, then actually this will feed in and benefit parallel verticals, so the ones which you know, aren't directly addressed by different relaxations, by different policies, because of the fact that it helps rebuild consumer confidence. Um, let's go to the next slide. But just one sort of home focus uh, element. It, here I've just highlighted in different colours, different sort of sub-segments of, uh, of the home sector. And what you can really see is that certain areas are doing slightly better. So actually furniture seems to be recovering better than most. You know, gardens are recovering quite well. As, but actually it's the sort of home generalist, the ones where maybe people nip in for one or two needs. It could also be met by supermarkets or somewhere like Flying Tiger or non-essential retail um, actually aren't recovering as well. And within these segments, we're also seeing winners. So Furniture Village, B&Q, the range seem to be doing significantly better than their competition. So some of this may be influenced by media, but it does in indicate that actually some of these are better positioned, uh, taking strategies that are better enabling them to win. Um, and that's Bushville. Thanks, Nathan. Um, without any further ado, hand straight over to Emily to talk through autos. Let me know when you need to be changing. Sweet. Thanks, Alex. Uh, yeah, you can go to the next one straight away, please. Um, so, yeah, so we've just been measuring automotives uh, week on week since the reopening. So, obviously, as Alex pointed out at the beginning, things closed on 23rd with the lockdown, and then automotives are opening up again on the 1st of June. Uh, the so far the predictions I've been reading about it have basically predicted that we're going to see this kind of rise at the start of this reopening followed by a bit of a slump the idea being that this initial rise is people kind of with with public transport being a lot less safe in terms of coronavirus um, people kind of want I think people want the freedom associated with the car I know I'm very jealous of my friends with cars who get to go and drive to like big green spaces that I can't get to so that initial kind of rise we're predicting is going to come from that. And then we're thinking there's probably going to be a bit of a slump after that because previously before what on everything, automotives in the UK weren't doing super well anyway. There was kind of this decrease year on year happening um, with the main positive being that energy efficient cars were more popular, but still too expensive to buy. Um, so yeah, so I think the financial difficulties are going to come into play after this initial rise. And then we might see a bit of a drop again. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the weekly share of footfall. So this is the share among all the all the all the brands that we've measured here. So you can see that Ford um, are doing the best uh, in all the weeks. So you've got this first pre-COVID week, which is a week in February that we took as like a baseline to see what the usual sort of pattern is that we see. And then we've got the first three weeks of the reopenings from the first of June. Um, so yeah, Ford, is, Ford seems to be doing the best in all the weeks that we've measured, but um, you are seeing in this third week that we've got that it is sort of evened out back to its pre-coronavirus level, which I think uh, is coming from a few of the other brands getting the sort of bump up in this week that we've measured. We've got like Hyundai, Mercedes and Nissan seem to be doing uh, a fair bit better than their previous weeks. The really interesting thing that we're seeing here, though, is that brands that were not doing so well in terms of their share of the footfall before coronavirus seem to suddenly have perked up quite a lot in this uh, 
sort of post lockdown period. So brands like Kia, Renault, Alfa Romeo and Fiat, which you'll see in the pre-week, pretty low share of the footfall uh, across the market. But then suddenly, yeah, in these past three weeks, they've like shot up, which I think is most likely a reflection of these diff the different consumer needs that we now have because people are thinking more financially because it's been kind of a hard time for everyone with furlough, et cetera, happening. Uh, and then people may be having just like different needs and like consumer values about cars and that kind of thing and maybe feeling a bit less about going for the most like flashy sort of car and more, more going for just the most useful and maybe the most financially viable. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So this is just looking at um, the football percentage we're seeing compared to how it was pre-coronavirus. So if you imagine that pre-COVID is your 100% of footfall, and then we're seeing the percentage of that that we've seen throughout the week. So we're seeing a really positive trend. You can see for nearly all in the table on the right, um, you can see nearly all of the brands apart from Lexus and BMW um, are, are doing their best in terms of recovery in the most recent week that we've got um and uh the graph is showing the same thing um so interestingly the brands i mentioned before that are doing surprisingly well when they weren't in terms of market share um also seem to be doing the best in terms of recovery so if you look at like alfa romeo fiat kia they're all on like 50 percent recovery as of two weeks ago um, which is really, really impressive considering how quickly that's turned around and considering that other brands, even like Ford, which is like always the most popular in terms of footfall and often sales is only on 34% and has been quite like a incremental increase, like 2% each time sort of thing. Um, I also mentioned that the BMW and Lexus having um, their best recovery the week before uh the number's actually not super different for them between week two and week three. So it's not like, a massive difference or anything there um yeah so it's just interesting to see these different sort of consumer values coming into play for the different brands that we're seeing recover a bit better than brands you might expect to recover much better uh, next slide please alex so just to kind of sum up the automotive stuff um like i said the prediction is that there's going to be this sort of initial rise as people really want the freedom of having a car again um, and then followed by a swift fall because of the financial implications that coronavirus has taken on everyone. And we are sort of seeing um, this rise that, that was predicted. So this, we're seeing an increase in all the footfall. Um, the recovery seems to be going quite well for all the brands. What will be really interesting to see now is if we see this drop off or if perhaps this rise continues because it's potentially um, the PM should be announcing a new scrappage scheme for incentive to buy energy efficient cars, which people do really want to be buying, um, but haven't been able to afford to do so before. So it'll be interesting to see if that may produce the rise continuing, and maybe we don't see that drop off, but we'll be keeping with all of this week by week, so we will see. And the other really interesting thing that we've seen is, like I said, these new sort of contenders that we weren't expecting to see do so well have been increasing their market share and having the best recovery so Kia, Renault, Alfa Romeo and Fiat um, which seems to be a reflection of consumer considerations for buying uh, being really different since lockdown. Um, so that's everything for automotives that I've got so if you could move on Alex. Awesome. Now I'm just going to talk about retail um, which opened up again non-essential retail that is uh, on the 15th of June. Uh, we've got the first week of data for the reopening so far. We should be getting uh, last week's data for both this and automotives towards the end of this week. So if anyone wants updated decks on that, just shoot me an email and you can get it sent towards the end of this week. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Uh, so yeah, this is again a weekly market share of the footfall. So we've got the pre-coronavirus, which is uh, a week we took in February, so before there was any kind of impact of it. Uh, and then week one, which from the 15th of June. So you're not seeing like massive changes, particularly for clothing, retail and sports retail, which have the same sort of share they had before. Obviously, people always need clothes and sports, I think, are going to maintain a lot of popularity because people can't go to the gym still. People want to go work out in the park and work out in their house. I've seen a lot of men doing prints in the park recently. Um, so sports retail, I think, is going to maintain its kind of similar share throughout. The interesting thing here is that electronics are seeing a bigger share than they had before uh covid hit and i think that's a reflection of um 
people basically wanting to deck out their house a lot more because you need good entertainment systems because you can't go out anywhere, can't go to cinema or anything. So you want to have a really good TV, a good laptop, etc. And then also, of course, everyone's working from home. Well, most people are working from home anyway. So you need like, you know, your second monitor, good laptop. You need it becoming a lot more necessary to have these good gadgets and electronics in your home. Uh, so next slide, please, Alex. So this is again the footfall percentage compared to before coronavirus. So we can kind of see the recovery here. Um, uh, interestingly, yeah, we're seeing uh, electronics are having the best recovery, um, which, like I said, I think is a big link to people wanting to make their in-home experience much nicer. Uh, I think it also kind of links to what the consumer surveys Alex went through was saying about how people are pretty keen to spend on home improvement. People just want to make their home space as nice as possible because we're still going to be stuck here for a while. And I think people, even though look that's easing, people are still very cautious about going out too much. I think everyone's going to feel a bit weird about going out too much once it ends anyway. So people want their home space to be as lively and entertaining as possible. So electronics, I think, make a lot of sense. And also, I think... In terms of what you want to go for an in-person experience to, like I think clothes you can buy online pretty easily. You don't go there just to get like an expert opinion. But electronics, you go to Curry's PC well because you have no idea what you want from your laptop and you want someone to give you expert advice. Or you go to Apple because they've got their geniuses there who can tell you exactly what to get and what to spend your money on. So I think the recovery for electronics makes a lot of sense because the in-person experience there is really important and really valuable compared to maybe some other types of store. Um, so we're going to be measuring that week on week. Um, so we should be getting, like I said, last week's data through towards the end of this week. So we start to maybe see what kind of pattern we're seeing if this electronics thing continues. Um, and that is everything for me. Cool. Thanks, Emily. Uh, and now just over to Emma to wrap up in a couple of minutes what we've been seeing as a general trend throughout for the grocery sector. Um, great, thank you, Alex. Um, what we've basically been doing is taking a measurement every two weeks uh, since uh, pre-COVID period in January. Thank you for changing the slide. Um, so since lockdown ended, we've been seeing this steady increase apart from this one period just after lockdown ended in sort of early mid-May where we had this huge spike, which we sort of saw across the board and we've seen in um, different areas. But since then, we've dropped down and we're starting to see this steady increase again, period on period, which reflects what we've seen in other countries after lockdown ended. Um, so that indicates that's probably going to be the uh, pattern that we see continuing. Um, so it sort of indicates that customers are interested in being safe, they're not rushing back, and that that might be one of their key concerns. And if you go to the next slide. Thank you. So we also saw that same pattern in loyalty, except the inverse. So loyalty dramatically decreased during this period, which sort of indicates that consumers were quite excited to go back and to visit lots of different stores. But this was just a one-time thing. It was a false recovery. And now loyalty is back up to where it was at lockdown levels. It's actually in the last period, it's gone up a little bit. While um, footfall has also been increasing, which indicates that consumers are going outside more, they're going to stores more, but they're only sticking to one or two trusted, reliable stores. They're not shopping around as much as they used to. So that means that the shops that they are visiting are even more important than they used to be. Um, if you go to the next slide. So if we look at all of the stores, um, we can see that the big four have seen the largest boost in loyalty, which reflects before um, lockdown, they were, they were still high, but they weren't as high as they are now. Um, that's probably because they have the, they've been following all of the safety rulings. They're larger, they're more reliably stocked and people already, they're well known, people trust them. So of those stores, Asda and Tesco have the highest loyalty right now at about 90%, which is really, really high. Um, since lockdown was relaxed and more workers returned to work, convenience stores have begin, been beginning to distance themselves from their competitors, which is convenience stores and premium stores, and they've become the second highest in loyalty. This is probably because they're convenient for workers to go and shop at while they're at work or after work. Um, Co-op is doing especially well out of that bunch. I would sort of expect to see convenience stores continue to be doing well as more people return to work as lockdown relaxes. 
Um, discounters currently have the lowest average loyalty, which is the first time this has happened since the um, a period in mid-March. Um, it sort of indicates that people are more concerned with their safety and the reliability of the shop they're going in than with how much money that they're spending right now. Like people would rather be safe than they would spend less money. So if this trend continues, we would expect to see loyalty begin to drop as customers get more confidence in going outside and going back to stores. Um, and we'd expect to see a sort of return to norm in footfall in about 12 weeks after schools open as uh, consumers slowly start to return to all of the stores across the board. Um, next update is coming soon. If anyone's interested, please send me a message. Great. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, lots to take on board there and lots of coverage for the supermarket sector out there at the moment as well. Uh, a lot of that's echoed in here, I think. Uh, perhaps Tesco doing a very, very good PR job despite seeing a slight fall back in share um, in this most recent period. So we'll wait and see how long it takes for financial concerns to override health ones for the discounters. Um, so to, th there is a very short summary slide after this, but uh, in the spirit of time, I don't think we can sum it up necessarily much better than, than Andy Haldane here does himself. Um, either consumer spending will ease unemployment or unemployment will cut household spending. So at the moment, this period we're in uh, is a bit of a bit of a balancing act, a bit of a knife edge we're on uh, with ongoing uh, insecurity around employment. People appear relatively unwilling to spend. Uh, but if all those on furlough can return to work and return to open jobs, then hopefully consumer spending um, will start to, to scrape us out of this recession. I think it's hindsight might let us see it as a V-shaped recovery. Uh, while we're in it, it will probably feel more bumpy than that. Um, maybe best case scenario is an italic V. Um, or, uh, or could be more of a Nike tick style thing where we, we've dropped off pretty quick, but it takes us a little bit longer to, re to recover when you iron out the, the bumpy slide, we have to um, sneak back up. Um, so that, that's the V-ish shaped recovery. Uh, levers have been pulled by the government to try and uh, generate B2B business um, back up as well, but it remains to be seen whether consumers take the same approach. We're seeing evidence that there is consumer caution um, more likely linked to the, the health crisis than, than spending potentially at the moment. So even as lockdown restrictions lift, consumer con uh, caution remains. Um, but if we are to uh, have to go back into second lockdowns and that V potentially becomes a W, it seems that the brands who have the greatest omni-channel flexibility for consumers will recover quicker um, as their best, best place to withstand the impact of any second wave that may yet come. Um, we've rattled through that a little bit, we've covered a lot of sectors, um, so if anybody has uh, any questions we're happy to take them now, if not the deck will be shared, sections of the deck will continue to be updated week on week as well. Um, so if nobody has any questions then right now feel free to drop them through to us afterwards. Uh, if not, we'll see you on the next one.